By raising Christ your son, you conquered the power of death and opened for us the way to eternal life. As we remember Thomas before you, so we ask for your help for all who gather in his memory. Grant us the assurance of your presence and grace by the spirit you have given to all who call on your name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Good afternoon and welcome to Christ Church Anglican Cathedral for the state funeral of Thomas Ian Pauling, 19th Administrator of the Northern Territory and former Solicitor General of the Northern Territory. My name is Rob Llewellyn. I am the Dean of Darwin and the Rector of Christ Church Cathedral. Welcome to His Honour Professor, the Honourable Hugh Heggie, Administrator of the Northern Territory, and Miss Ruth Jones, to the Honourable Natasha Files, Chief Minister of the Northern Territory, to Tessa and the family, distinguished guests, family, friends, and colleagues. It is good to be gathered here today for this sad but significant occasion as we say goodbye to Tom. This afternoon's service will consist of two parts, a time of reflection on Tom's life and a time of reflection on God's word to us from the Bible readings chosen for today by the family. Following the service, the family invites you to share in refreshments with them, which will be in the courtyard of Browns Mart, just across the park. We have come together to mourn a relative, to honour a departed friend, to dispose reverently of the mortal body and to show sympathy with the bereaved. We believe that those who die in Christ share eternal life with him. 
Therefore, in faith and hope, we offer our prayer of thanksgiving and trust to God, in whose loving care we leave Thomas Ian Pauling. We recall the certainty of our own coming death and judgment, and we proclaim that Christ is risen, that those who believe in him will rise with him. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, yet they will live. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Can I invite you to open your order of service and pray with me the first of the congregational prayers together, which is just on the bottom of the page, which says, Welcome. Together. God, our Father, you alone are holy. Forgive us all our sins and failures. Uphold us by your Spirit. Enable us to show compassion. Give us in our sorrow the calm of your peace. May our grief give way to joy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now is the opportunity for us to remember Tom. And so can I invite those who are to speak to come up in order. Today we farewell a distinguished Territorian, a true territory legend whose remarkable life and contributions have left an indelible mark on our community and anyone he came in contact with. I would like to acknowledge the Larrakia people, the traditional custodians and the land in which we stand and pay my respects to elders and extend that respect to the descendants past, present and emerging. Known for his generous spirit, intelligence, wit, humour and for his talents as a performer on stage, Mr Tom Pauling, AO, KC, was genuinely admired and respected by everyone from all walks of life. Tom arrived in the Northern Territory in 1970, and from that moment, he wove himself into the fabric of our community. He made a significant contribution to Territory life, helping significantly with the effort to evacuate thousands of Territorians after Cyclone Tracy in 1974. As a barrister, he dedicated himself to the pursuit of justice. He was a founding member of the NT Bar Association in 1974, and became the Solicitor General of the Northern Territory in 1988, a role he embraced with distinction until 2007. And then we were honoured to have Tom's service as the 19th Administrator of the Northern Territory from 2007 to 2011. In 2008, our nation recognised his significant contribution by awarding him the Officer of the Order of Australia. It is Tom's connection, his commitment to the Territory community that is in the hearts and minds of many and that makes him a Territory legend. As we know, he was a passionate supporter of the arts. Alongside his beautiful wife, Tessa, he championed the creative spirit as a philanthropist, performer, mentor to many and an avid audience member. He was the co-patron of the Darwin Theatre Company and tread many aboard on the territory stages, including Brown's Mart Theatre, which is next door to us today. Tom played a pivotal role in establishing the Darwin Performing Arts Centre, later renamed as the Darwin Entertainment Centre, where he served as chairman from 1985 to 1994. His legacy will endure through the memories of those who knew him, the institutions he enriched, and the cultural spaces he supported and advocated for. In this sad time, we reflect and we express our deepest condolences to his family, friends, and all who had the privilege of sharing in his wisdom and warmth. On behalf of the Northern Territory Government and all Territorians, I extend our deepest sympathies to Tom's wife, Tessa, to Fred and Zoe, and to the grandchildren. In the words of the great bard, all the world's a stage and all the men and women are merely players. They have their exits and their entrances, and one man in his time plays many parts. In this time of profound loss, let us remember the memories of Tom's many roles, his warmth, his laughter, 
his unwavering commitment to our community, the definition of a true territory legend. Rest in peace. As we've just heard from the Chief Minister, Tom made an extraordinary contribution to the Northern Territory in so many capacities over the 53 years um, that he spent here. He loved this place deeply and it loved him in return. Tom was only 24 years old when he arrived in Darwin. By that stage of his life, he'd been working at the Public Solicitor's Office in Sydney for six years. And he'd begun to feel uh, trapped by city traffic and conformity. As fate would have it, he picked up a Law Society journal, which fell open at an ad for a solicitor's position in Darwin. Uh, Tom rang the principal of the firm, who happened to be George Cridland. George told Tom that although the ad had been placed four months ago now, uh, Tom was the first person who had expressed any interest in it. <laughs> the interview, such as it was, consisted of George asking Tom whether he had a law degree, Tom confirming that he did, and George saying, you've got the job. When Tom arrived, Darwin was a very different place than it is now. Uh, the population was about 35,000 people. Uh, there was one resident judge, um, one magistrate in Darwin, and another in Alice Springs, and about 30 practicing lawyers. The average age of those lawyers was less than 30, but what they lacked in experience they made up for with energy and courage. One of the first cases that came to Tom was the Gove land rights case, in which the traditional owners of the Gove Peninsula were suing Nabalco and the Commonwealth Government for the possession of land subject to mining leases. Tom acted for the traditional owners in a trial which commenced only two months after his arrival in Darwin. Although they were ultimately unsuccessful, it was the first Australian case in which traditional evidence was recognised as a special body of law. It was the first Australian case in which anthropological evidence was found to be admissible in the identification of that law. It was the first Australian case in which it was accepted by the court that Aboriginal owners had an elaborate system of social rules and customs which included communal native title. It was that case which uh, formed the platform for the land rights reforms and everything that came after that, culminating in the decision in Mabo. That case also began Tom's enduring love affair with Aboriginal people and with their art and culture. Much of his work over the next uh, 37 years would involve land claims and native title and he travelled extensively through the remotest parts of the Northern Territory for that purpose. Apart from his uh, work on Aboriginal land matters, Tom assumed responsibility at a very young age for complex matters, ranging from uh, arresting ships in Admiralty to uh, acting for claimants who had suffered catastrophic personal injuries. He conducted his first murder trial when he was still only 24 years old, which is almost unthinkable now. Uh, Tom successfully argued self-defence, and when the accused was acquitted, as a sign of his gratitude, he gave Tom the war club that he'd used to dispatch his assailant. That had never happened in the public solicitor's office in Sydney, and Tom still had that club more than 50 years later. From those beginnings, Tom quickly established himself as one of the Northern Territory's leading advocates. In those early years, the justice system in the Northern Territory was relatively undeveloped. Um, there was no system of legal aid and there was no independent bar. In 1974, Tom and Michael Maurice established an independent bar whose members were required to commit to practice exclusively in the style of barristers. Uh, Ian Barker QC joined them after his office was destroyed during Cyclone Tracy. Uh, this was a landmark development for the Northern Territory because for the first time there was a body of lawyers who were obliged to represent any client who came along regardless of the powerful governmental or corporate interests which might be ranged against them. It, it was also an institution through which people who had a good case but no money to press it could secure legal representation. So this was a very significant step for the Northern Territory in ensuring access to justice and the protection of individual rights. That was something of which Tom was justifiably proud. 
In fact, he regarded the establishment of the independent bar as perhaps his greatest professional achievement. Uh, that achievement was recognised uh, by the conferral of life membership uh, of the Bar Association in 2002, and it's celebrated by the presence here today of so many current members of the Darwin Bar. One of the early cases Tom ran as an independent barrister was the Queen against Anunga. In that case, Tom successfully argued that the manner in which police officers had interrogated his client um, had led to unfairness and an involuntary confession. Uh, in the judgment, the Supreme Court laid down uh, for the first time what became known as the Anunga Rules to regulate the conduct of police officers when questioning Aboriginal suspects, and they still do regulate that activity. Those rules were based largely on Tom's submissions, and this was another significant step in the development of a body of jurisprudence in the Northern Territory directed to the protection of individual rights. In 1977, Tom took appointment as a magistrate. I suspect that was out of curiosity about life on the other side of the bar table rather than any sort of long-term career choice because he left after three years and returned to the private bar. During his time at the bar, Tom had two particularly close friends and mentors. The first was Sir William Forster, who was the Chief Justice under various titles between 1971 and 1985. The other was Ian Barker, QC. He worked closely with Barker in many matters, most famously in the prosecution of the Chamberlains. They remained lifelong friends. Tom was appointed as a Queen's Counsel in 1984 and then as the Northern Territory's third Solicitor General in 1988. Ian Barker had been the first and Tom was by this appointment following in the footsteps of his old friend and mentor. Tom was to remain in that position uh, for almost 20 years, which is a record most unlikely to be broken. In that role, he was the first Solicitor General to adopt a coherent and strategic approach to the advancement of the Northern Territory's constitutional position. It is no exaggeration to say that without Tom's work on constitutional issues, the Northern Territory may well have uh, become a pale vassal uh, of the Commonwealth Government. As it was, in that period, the Territory established itself as a quite distinct and independent body politic. That was due in large part to arcane battles that Tom fought uh, in the High Court far away in Canberra about issues such as whether the Commonwealth Government was bound by the ordinary constitutional guarantees and restrictions uh, when legislating about the Territory, whether Northern Territory courts exercised their own native jurisdiction or some federal jurisdiction, and whether Northern Territory judges had to be appointed in the same way as federal judges. I know that this achievement over so many years was a matter of great satisfaction and pride for Tom, but it was something that few people knew of and even fewer people understood. In that role, Tom was held in especially high regard by the judges of the High Court of Australia, both for his canny advocacy and for his sense of humour. I recall in one case Tom referred the court to an old legal authority of very marginal relevance. It was from a time when the law reports were still published in the newspaper. In this particular edition, only the bottom half of the page was taken up by the law report. The top half of the page contained a story about a naked lion tamer, together with a lurid picture of said lion tamer. Tom handed the page up to the members of the bench, urging them to focus their attention exclusively on the law report and to on no account let their eyes stray to the top half of the page. The only time you ever saw seven judges of the High Court giggling like schoolchildren was when Tom was addressing them. Uh, his, his charm and his good nature were entirely disarming, even in that most serious of forums. Tom's time as Solicitor General only ended on his appointment as Administrator. He was a perfect fit for that role as head of the body politic which he'd nurtured in so many ways over the previous 40 odd years. Uh, he was a man of the people and he could find common ground with anybody. Um, as you've already heard from the Chief Minister, his interests weren't directed to the narrow pursuit of law, 
Um, he was the archetypal Renaissance man. He was also an accomplished actor, uh, director, writer, historian and classicist. Uh, by way of example, many of you here today will know that his knowledge of Charles Darwin's voyages and work was encyclopedic. Uh, Tom's interest in the subject matter was no doubt motivated by the fact that the man had given his name to the city which Tom loved so much. Tom's intellectual and emotional investment in the city was also reflected in the series of theatrical productions he staged over the years which dramatised uh, vignettes from Darwin's history such as the rebellion in, 2000, in 1918. Uh, it, it was fitting then that Tom came into the role from which Gilruth had been effectively ejected um, almost 90 years before. And Tom distinguished himself as administrator just as he'd done in all of his many previous roles. The true strength and quality of Tom's character is demonstrated by the way he's lived his life over the past few months. There has been no hint of fear or self-pity, only stoicism and positive reflection. Tom's response to his circumstances has been to draw his beloved wife, his children, his grandchildren and his long-term friends to his bosom. There they've revelled and gloried in the adventure and the humour and the love that characterise their lives with him. And that is, no doubt, his greatest legacy. The courts and the legal profession in the Northern Territory are immensely proud to claim Tom as one of our own. Uh, we honour him and we salute him and we extend our deepest condolences to Tessa, Fred, Zoe and the family. Thank you for the kind thank you for the kind words, Chief Justice and Chief Minister. So on behalf of the family, I'd like to thank everyone for being here with us today, Tom's seventy seventh birthday, to celebrate his rich life and his contributions to the territory. We'd like to thank the Northern Territory Government for their support today, Christchurch Cathedral, very Reverend Rob the place where Tom and Tessa were married in 1978. And everyone, for your love, support and compassion. Tom is a man who truly lived and loved. He left the world a better place and perhaps in his passing we can be inspired to do the same how to live like Tom, heart open, mind open, eyes open, intellect aflame. Turn over that rock, listen to the trees, follow the stream, discover its mysteries, bring a friend, plant trees, plant many rare trees, help them grow, be patient, watch them flourish, plant some more. Seize life's opportunities with both hands, give it everything that you've got. Love with your heart and occasionally consult your head. Dream, dream big, you have imagined it now bring it into the world. Share your dream. It takes a village. Be compassionate to yourself, to every being. Stand up for what's right and good and just. Choose your battles and turn the other cheek. And love. Love life. It's very, it's every detail, it's very essence. Love the people in your life, wrap them in your heart. The more love you give, the more love you have to give. Happy birthday, Dad, we'll always love you.
Dad, where do I begin? Start at the beginning, keep going until you get to the end, then stop. There is no beginning, just as there is no end. Love is eternal. My love is eternal. Your love is eternal. Dad's eyes were the brightest blue. I loved to stare into them as he told me stories. I stared into them as I told mine. And we shared moments of joy, sadness and laughter. Dad's hugs were huge, completely embracing me. As he squeezed me tight, I could always feel that he was filling me with courage, energy, pride, compassion and love. So much love. Dad's hands, his hands, were always busy. His hands performed, spoke, cooked, danced, wrote, endless writing. Dad's hands picked up his children and held us on his shoulders. Dad's hand held our babies and danced with them. Dad's hands painted and drew, planted, endlessly gardened, clapped, shook hands and came to rest. We held his hands as his heart slowly stopped. Dad's heart beat for others. Dad's heart was felt by so many and his love is enduring in all those who knew and loved him. Mum and Dad coloured my world with the most vivid colours and so much love and compassion. They taught me how to love others and most importantly myself. They showed me the value of integrity, humility, loyalty and meaningful connections. I always knew where Dad was when he was in one place. Now I know he is everywhere. I see him in every bromeliad flower in my garden, in every storm and in every star in the night sky. Every colour, every light, every sparkle is even more vivid as you continue to be my mentor, my inspiration, my friend, my dad. Dad, for you, time does not exist and we will be with you in an instant. For me, for us, it will feel like a lifetime before we are together in the same plane again. Knowing you are with me now and will be again brings me comfort in this pain. I hope I can continue to make you proud by being the person you helped to grow with your hands, your hugs, your eyes and your heart. See you on the dark side of the moon. Our first reading comes from Corinthians 13. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor, Give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonour others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be ceased. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prosper in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child, and I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put away the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, 
then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. Now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. A reading from Proverbs 3. Blessed are those who find wisdom, those who gain understanding. For she is more profitable than silver and yields better returns than gold. She is more precious than rubies. Nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand. In her left hand are riches and honour. Her ways are pleasant ways, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who take hold of her, and those who hold her fast will be blessed. Further remember Tom and take back the happy memories with us. Uh, there is a slideshow that has been prepared for, by the family, these private reflections. to sing out a key. Certain it happens all the time, yeah. What 
giving thanks for Tom's life, let me pray. Father of all mercies and giver of all comfort, deal graciously, we pray, with those who mourn, that casting all their care on you, they may know the consolation of your love through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who died and rose again to save us and now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit in glory forever. Amen. That's the opening words of our service said this afternoon. We gather here for three reasons. We gather to honour a departed friend, to honour Tom in the manner that he deserves. The eulogies, your presence here today does that well. We take opportunity to say goodbye, to let the hurts go and to take home the happy memories. We gather to show sympathy with the bereaved, with Tessa, with the family. The opportunity to continue in this is extended to share in refreshments uh, with the family in the courtyard of Brown Smart over the, over the park immediately following the service. We also gather to recall the certainty of our own coming death and judgment. We take a moment today to stop and to think about bigger issues of life and death and what comes after. The order of service is quite magnificent. I would encourage you to read it if you haven't already, uh, to take it home and to reflect on the words in it. Some of the final words in the order of service speak today about Tom Pauling's ability to remember, to organise and to compose ideas and language. It's therefore appropriate that the readings that have been chosen today do just that. They organise some of the greatest composers of ideas and language in human history. William Shakespeare, Albert Einstein, Sergei Prokofiev, Claude Debussy, the Apostle Paul, King Solomon. You'll notice that two themes when you read through these readings stand out clearly. And I take it that these two themes are evident, have been evident uh, in Tom. The themes of wisdom and of love. Wisdom which transcends mere knowledge and makes decisions which are right. Love which transcends time and involves sacrifice for the sake of the other. 
Perhaps, as the closing words of the Order of Service say, Tom seemed immortal. Perhaps that's because of what these readings say about wisdom and about love. That wisdom and love are characteristics of immortality. Albert Einstein's words show that as a theoretical physicist, he wasn't inhibited from speaking in a way which echoes the words that were in King Solomon's uh, proverb. That wisdom is beyond, goes beyond the empirical and is found in the mystical. And Shakespeare likewise echoes the Apostle Paul's words in the first letter to the Corinthians that we heard when he speaks of a love which transcends the mortal. It goes forever. That love, this love that is spoken of, is not uh, bound by mortality, uh, with the rosy lips, for example, but is a shadow of a timeless love, an immortal love. Wisdom and love are characteristics of the divine. And the two Bible readings push these ideas a little further, quite much further, actually. They suggest that the reason that wisdom and love are characteristics of the divine is that they come from the Lord. From the Proverbs reading, the life-giving wisdom, which is incomparable, more precious than gold or rubies, is a gift from God, given by him, by his grace into his creation. Just previously, just before this reading that was chosen, it says in chapter 2, for the Lord gives wisdom. For his mouth, from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. And likewise, the 1 Corinthians reading, which speaks about love which is generous and other person focused and patient and kind, that does not envy, it does not boast, it's not proud, it's not dishonoring. This type of love is also a gift from God. And particularly seen in the gift of love in the sending of Jesus Christ, God's Son, into a world which Christians celebrate uh, at this time of Christmas, this time of year. According to the Bible, Jesus Christ, it is in Jesus Christ that we see the wisdom and the love of God encapsulated and displayed most clearly. And that clarity comes to sharpest focus in the crucifixion of Jesus. The reason for the season, so to speak. Now, Easter is the reason for the Christmas season. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. No one has greater love than this, then one lays down his life for his friends. And so today, as we take this brief moment to stop, to pause, to think about life and death and what comes after, as we stop and think about Tom's life, of his wisdom, of his love, we may perhaps stop and thank God for Tom. Thank God for his gift of wisdom, his gift of love, which, when displayed in a person such as Tom, is a shadow and a sign of the ultimate gift of wisdom and love given in the person of Jesus Christ, the one who entered the stage in a way that nobody else ever has before or after him. Thank God for the cross of Christ on which God accomplished his wisdom and his love, his justice through sacrifice who gives us hope of life after death through his powerful resurrection. We might give thanks to God for what we call the gospel, the good news, that Jesus himself is God's wisdom and God's love. Christ died, he has risen, he is exalted, and he is God's wisdom and love. In the name of God the Father, and God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Can I invite you to pray with me? The congregational prayer under the page where it says address, followed by the Lord's Prayer. Let's pray. Help us, Lord, to understand and receive your gospel so that we might find light in our darkness, strength in our grief, and hope and comfort in your saving words. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As we come to the conclusion of our service today, in a moment I will ask you to stand after which I will say the final words from the scriptures and pray the prayer of committal. Can I ask you to please stand? We brought nothing into this world and we can take nothing out of the world. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though they die. Almighty God, our heavenly Father, you have given us a sure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life. In your keeping are all those who have departed in Christ. We here commit the body of Thomas Ian Pauling, having been cremated. Earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who died and was buried, and rose again for us, and who shall change our mortal body, that it may be like his glorious body. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.